Binge the full week of The Ray Taylor Show ad-free over at InspiredDisorder.com slash plus. This is The Ray Taylor Show. Welcome to The Ray Taylor Show, where I bring you reviews of the latest movies and TV shows, as well as classic and foreign films. I'm your host, Ray Taylor, and on this podcast, I'll be talking about all things film and television. Whether you're looking for a new show to binge or want to know if that blockbuster is worth the trip to the theater or just want to hear my thoughts on a classic or foreign film, I've got you covered. So join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for new episodes, and let's dive into the world of film and television together. On today's episode, I am talking about the film The Doom Generation. This came out in 1995. This one is written and directed by Greg Araki. It stars James Duvall, Rose McGowan, and Jonathan Shaish. I don't know how to pronounce that. In this movie, Jordan White and Amy Blue, two troubled teens, pick up an uh, adolescent drifter, Xavier Red. Together, the threesome embarks on a sex and violence filled journey through an America of psychos and quickie marts. Uh, I really like this movie. This uh, this movie is the second film in the Greg Araki Teenage Apocalypse trilogy. I reviewed last week, Totally Fucked Up. Next week, I will be reviewing Nowhere, which is the third and final film in this three-film series, uh, and uh, which they call a trilogy. <laughs> But I really like this film. I I like this more than... I guess this was his first legitimate uh, theatrical film, big theatrical film, where clearly the uh, previous film, Totally Fucked Up, was very independent, low budget. Uh, This movie had a lot of very interesting elements uh, that I enjoyed. Many of these... I mean, all these elements I enjoyed from this film... Uh, that are very much 90s. Like I said about Totally Fucked Up, movie that transported you back to life in the 90s, this movie does that as well, and so much of the elements of this film uh, remind me of pop culture elements uh, from the 90s. Uh, Specifically, Pulp Fiction, Rose McGowan's character, looks very much like the Pulp Fiction. I forget the character's name in Pulp Fiction, but... That I had, which came out a year before this movie, I have to assume that when Pulp Fiction came out, I don't remember specifically, but I have to assume that there were a lot of teenage girls dressing up like the woman in with the black bob haircut and bangs from Pulp Fiction. The dude, Jordan, talks like Bill from Bill and Ted's. You have elements of this film that reminded me of 1990s Tim Burton, which is very interesting as well. So different elements brought me back to the 90s as the previous film did. Uh, Unlike, you know, brought brought me back to the 90s, unlike most films that uh, are set in the 90s. I mean, this is, it it really, it's it's weird how these movies really teleport you back to those times. Uh, This also is a very sexy movie. Uh, That's very much of the 90s. Like, sexy in a way that can only, like would only make sense if this were made in the 90s like it wouldn't necessarily make as much sense which i'll get into all that in spoilers but very sexy movie i would say and this movie is billed as a heterosexual movie by greg araki which i assume that means that this he he generally does more of queer cinema than uh your normo cisgendered heterosexual which i would say this movie blurs those lines in a way that is far more common in culture in 2024 but in the 90s was i would say pushing boundaries in some ways especially for movies and just society in general to kind of have the lines of sexual preference blurred um yeah i don't know 
but I love this movie. <laughs> I definitely recommend it for all the 90s kids out there. And anybody interested in wanting to take a trip back to the 90s, and I mean, this isn't like an authentic, grounded take on the 90s, but there are so many of the elements of this movie are s like just hardcore 90s. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll get back to the show after the short message. Are you a true fan of the Ray Taylor show? Do you crave more content, more insight, more of everything that makes this show great? Then Inspired Disorder Plus is exactly what you need. For only $5 a month, transform your listening and viewing experience into something extraordinary. No more waiting, no more ads. Enjoy the full week of episodes of The Ray Taylor Show in both audio and video formats, completely ad-free. But that is just the beginning. You'll get exclusive early access to the Many Faces series. You can dive into our extensive live painting archive. You can enjoy special deals and discounts that are only available to our members. The perks don't just stop there. Delve into an extensive back catalog of over 14 podcasts with over 618 episodes. Get posted, get personal posts from Ray Taylor through his blog. That's my blog. That's me. You can expand your horizons with my creative writing section and participate in an Ask Me Anything section where your questions bring life to our community. Ready to step up your game? Visit InspiredDisorder.com slash plus and join our exclusive club. It's not just content. It's an experience. See you on the plus side. Now let's get back to the show. This movie is steeped in 90s, right? The look of the film and some of the characters is very much inspired by Pulp Fiction. Uh, there is uh, a performance that is definitely Keanu Reeves. Jordan's performance is totally Keanu Reeves from Bill and Ted. There is a very pulpy reality this film exists in that touches i would say on some great like b-movie horror films like uh campy horror films very much uh, moments that remind me of sam raimi films while also being a very kind of raw and gritty indie film at the same time like this is referencing so many things in pop culture while also being a very like rough around the edges film which i i love that aspect uh this film is also sexy in a way that only works in the 90s as i said before with you know with the internet that we have today sexuality i i would say is far more fluid and viewed as far more of a spectrum i mean by most people i would say including especially the younger generation i think the each generation that follows gets more and more understanding that sexuality is is far more of a preference and far more of a spectrum i should say and uh you know is is kind of a thing where you don't know until you try as well it's hard to know what you like and what you don't like until you've tried or put yourself in those situations um, but I think just opening up that spectrum of sexuality is done in a way in this movie and characters handle it in a way which is very new for the the what life was like in the mid 90s uh, where things were far more binary than they were today as far as sexuality is concerned. Like I remember growing up in the 90s like I was like 15, 14 when this movie came out. Right. So not sexually active by any means and uh, had no like I definitely knew I was uh, attracted to women. But like, you know, and I knew the concepts of, you know, gay and straight and bisexual. Right. But that was kind of it. Like there wasn't the the understandings we have in 2024 are far past those kind of very minimal types of categories somebody could be placed into like you're either one of those three like there's nothing else that exists <laughs> uh and i think now we understand that everything exists 
Um, you know, most people in 2024, I would say, understand sexuality is, is, isn't a binary thing as it was considered to be in the 90s. That, like everything in life, I would say, there is complexity and abundance to everything. So each person has their own unique desires and their own unique collections of ways. Uh, whereas in the 90s, it was far more binary, right? Being gay or bisexual were more accepted in the 90s than previous decades, but still very limited in scope compared to now. And, you know, for the time, the 90s, when this movie came out, this film, I would say introduces a more fluid idea of sexuality. And, you know, it's set in the world where crazy people with guns are the real threat uh, and taken to very ridiculous levels in this movie. There is an aspect of this film that is like a campy Sam Raimi film. Um, I wasn't expecting, but fits with the pulpy nature, the kind of that kind of over the top uh, campiness that this movie has. But we'll also go real. You know, this movie can also go real dark. Um, within those over-the-top moments as well. This movie also reminded me of uh, Bobcat Goldthwait's film, uh, God Bless America, which is a great movie. And when thinking about that after watching this or while watching this, I was like, I need to go back and watch all of Bobcat's movies because he's only done a few of them. Uh, but I absolutely love God Bless America. And this, I would say this movie in some ways almost exists in a similar universe uh, as the doom generation. Um, you know, both are kind of over the top in violent campy ways. Uh, but except for, you know, God bless America is not as sexy. It's just more about people kind of being fed up with <laughs> fed up with in the most violent way, what our culture has become um, and came out in like early two thousands. It's, it's a good one. Go check it out. God bless America. Um, you know, in this movie, there's not that much plot. It's basically these kids are involved in something bad that happens and are on the run, kind of. You know, every and every time these three enter into like the, a new world or into the world in general, right? A lot of this movie is spent either in like hotel room, motel rooms or convenience stores. Like that tends to be the two locations that this movie uh, exists in um, and every time they step out of that those two look and even when they're in those locations they are butted up with society which is absolutely insane um, and something another crazy thing happens where lives are at risk uh, you know but at the core of this movie is this like unique love triangle that exists which I was like that's that is the core it's weird how this movie has like so many crazy things happening outside of this kind of sexy strange love triangle that is happening uh as they're on the run it is a very interesting combination of things that this movie has this movie's doing let's take a brief intermission from the show imagine dear listeners a piece of art that does more than just decorate a wall Visualize owning a limited edition print from The Many Faces, a series that melds the beauty of the abstract and the allure with, of the surreal. Each print is a conversation piece, a slice of artistic wonder in your own home. But what really elevates these prints, they come with my personal signature and unique number, making their authenticity and exclusivity a must. And guess what? Indulging in this art won't empty your wallet. Starting from just $5 for a 4 by 6 inch print are designed to be accessible, fitting both your space and your budget. To art enthusiasts, collectors, or anyone who cherishes one-of-a-kind pieces, this is your moment. Transform your living space with a touch of artistic elegance. Head on over to InspiredDisorder.com to select your exclusive limited edition prints today. And now let's return to the show with that extra bit of inspiration. But I do want to talk about spoilers. So if you haven't seen this movie and you don't want to be spoiled, this is your warning. 
so this movie, similar to Totally Fucked Up, also brings up, I mean, it has like uh, Jordan and, and Amy are having sex at the beginning of this movie. And he's having issues, and it's because of his worry uh, of the AIDS crisis. Like, he's scared he's going to get eggs. AIDS. <laughs> he's going to get eggs in his AIDS. AIDS in his eggs. Um, and it's a straight couple, which I, I noticed right away after having seen his previous film. And also hilarious that this movie's build is Greg Araki's heterosexual film. Like, I was like, okay, like, I can get into this in a in a, a deeper way than i i could get into the previous film uh and you know james duvall comes back as one of the leads of this film as well you know interesting performance as a doing a keanu reeves from bill and ted uh they both have feelings like before things get really crazy they both talk about having feelings that something crazy is going to happen to them. Like something, like something's going to happen. Like they just feel really weird. And I'm like, Ooh, like that's definitely, thank you for setting up that something, the crazy things are going to happen. Could not have predicted the crazy things that happen in this movie, but I love the heads up little foreshadow, the clear and present foreshadowing of them both having feelings that something's going to, going to happen. Uh, they, they, pick up this hitchhiker guy and uh and jordan right right from from the beginning seems to have a lot of chemistry with this guy xavier uh who they picked up like it's it's very like the chemistry like the sexual tension that exists between jordan and xavier throughout this movie is palpable it is palpable and played very interesting Many moments in the film where I thought they were going to just kiss. Like, they're right there. And it's just like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then it never happens. Um, which I guess is kind of, you know, st st part of the part of what this movie's doing. Like, just kind of teasing you. This movie's teasing you. Uh, as far as the connection that Jordan and Xavier have. Um when they show up, the, one of the early scenes when they go to a convenience store, Jordan getting food, right? Getting this the convenience store food and slushy uh, just totally brought me back to when I was in my early 20s and, like, lived out of an ATM. That didn't literally, but, like, a lot of the food and medicine, like, that was my grocery store, right? I didn't make enough money to, like, go to real grocery stores, but I could get like their two hot dog combo or uh, when I would get sick, I would literally hide medicine like cough drops in the hot dog wrapper so that I could pay for a hot dog and actually get cold medicine when I was sick. Because that was like just how I could the only way I could get cold medicine. Also worked at a movie theater next to a convenience store and we would go me and the other like floor staff when we're like cleaning theaters and was like about to be a break for lunch we would go to ampm and we would fill up a kid's cup with nacho cheese from ampm and chili the chili for the nachos but we wouldn't buy the nachos we would just pay for the kid's cup of soda but it wasn't filled with soda then we'd go back to the theater where we had nacho chips which weren't inventoried we would have nacho chips and one of those L trays, those cardboard trays you get, and we put it in the, in, the, in the bun warmer so that when you brought the chips out, they were warm and crispy. It was like the perfect thing. So we would get back from AMP and we'd have these nacho and we'd pour it on there. We'd go into a movie and we'd watch a movie. That's the life I was living, living on hot dog loading, loaded up with all the condiments that were for free, right? Getting medicine. This is a crazy time. And this was, you know, early 2000s for me, but my early 20s. Um, so when he goes, you know, and gets his meal at the convenience store, I was like, oh, man, I remember that. Um, and then they get the gun pulled on him. And, of course, there's a sign right behind them, which is another, like, foreshadowy moment uh, where the sign in big block letters says, we'll execute shoplifters. And, of course, he right after that sign is prominently featured 
you have Jordan coming up to pay and realizing that he doesn't have any money, that Xavier probably stole all their money when he, you know, when they gave him the ride. Uh, Rose McGowan's character has some great one-liners throughout this movie, Amy's character. Uh, you have Xavier multiple times coming from out of nowhere to wrestle a person with a gun, like to save these two from imminent danger. Uh, so he comes back, uh, and we see like when the, the store clerk's head literally gets blown off by the shotgun, I was like, oh, this is the kind of, this is the Sam Raimi kind of movie we're watching here, right? This is, you know, the Evil Dead 2 <laughs> version of this movie as his head goes. And then even further than just the head popping off, uh, you see that this disembodied head tries to talk and like guacamole is co coming out of his mouth. And it's like so like over the top. Hilarious. Um, it's just like it... it really set the tone right i i realized this could be you know a much different toned film than i had expected completely different than uh everything's fucked or all fucked up or fu everything's fucked up what was the last movie i forget the, the title of the last movie uh i just thinking about the guy's head getting blown off it completely erased the the title of the the movie before but very B movie horror, but in the best way. Like I loved seeing it. Um, and I'm like curious how wacky this movie is going to get right. Very funny scene. Um, totally fucked up is the movie. No comedy in totally fucked. I mean, I guess some kind of humor to it, but this has got some comedy to it, which I, I love that. Then they all get to know each other at the motel uh, they all kind of, we see that they all kind of come from rough families, except for Jordan, it seems, who just kind of grew up in Encino. Uh, that's his big, uh, troubled past, but Xavier and Amy have troubled past. You can see Xavier trying to seduce Jordan. Meanwhile, you have this gorgeous Rose McGowan taking a bath in the bathtub. Uh, and then you have Jordan coming in to to pee which transitions into them having sex this is like the sexiness not only the chemistry between xavier and jordan that clear like when he's talking about his tattoo and he's like laying on the bed and like everybody i mean this is another thing that would only happen in the 90s where tattoos in the 90s were just really small like tribal tattoos in the 90s it's like really small like three inches on a shoulder or maybe something wrapping around a wrist so for xavier's character to have this kind of big tribal chest piece is so novel to these kids in the 90s which today would be like oh you gotta tat they wouldn't even mention that he has a tattoo on his chest but both of these characters are like transfixed by xavier's tattoo uh but yeah jordan going into p transitioning into him having sex with uh with amy in the bathtub very sexy very sexy and then you have like cut to the news that is very goofy very much like a you know f uh, like a like a trauma type of a type of a newscast um doing like morning radio sound effects uh really bad green screen where like their their dude's tie is transparent and her like plant that she has in her pen is green so it's transparent as well um you find out that the wife of the convenience store owner ended up killing the kids and herself for some reason so they're kind of off the hook like they said there's no witnesses but i'm like isn't there cameras like this isn't like, they can't be off the hook. That's not just how they're writing them off. But it's like they're kind of off the hook, which I don't know why they did that. But, you know, another very dark comedy that, you know, oh, she killed herself and the kids. Um, but another very sexy scene, right? You have Jordan and Amy having sex in the bathtub. You have Xavier, like, walking up to this cracked door. He can see through the crack in the door what they're doing he can hear them and instead of going in he just jerks off in the the doorway the crack of the door 
right? And then tastes his own cum off of his hand. Very much reminded me, like, the the level of sexiness of this movie reminded me of Saltburn, which came out recently and kind of ruffled some feathers of uh, people who may not be ready to see uh, a person licking cum out of the drain of a bathtub, you know? But if you're somebody that that didn't ruffle the feathers of and you're like, whoa, that's spicy for sure, that's, then this is the movie. Uh, and that is the scene. Um, then they end up getting another shotgun pulled on him. This time it's at a fast food place where the cashier mistakes Amy for one of his exes, which is a running joke that happens. And I don't think it's explained. I have some theater theories that I will that I will talk about later. But it is a running gag that Amy, everywhere they go, it seems that somebody thinks Amy is somebody else. And I think there's a couple answers for that, which I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, you have her waking up. I think they're at another motel at this point. It could be at the same motel. Um, and you have her waking up to Xavier it kind of kneeling in their bed. She's sharing the bed with Jordan. She wakes up and, and Xavier's kneeling in the bed, just kind of jerking off watching her. And you could tell, like, looks like he's going to shoot on both of them. And she wakes up and clearly looks like she's into it. And it seems like, again, she's talking about his chest tattoos. Like, oh, I love your tattoo. Um, and, you know, they both love his tattoo. But, like you find out that it's not that's not the tattoo she was talking about apparently he's got a tattoo of jesus on his dick uh and uh that way for the gag while he's having sex with somebody he can say they can say that jesus was inside me right that's the which gag tattoos were also kind of big in the 90s like small tribal tattoos and gag tattoos uh, I think we're big, big things in the 90s, or at least people from the 90s. Um, so they end up having sex in the car, right? Because they don't want it. They start in the bed and they look over and Jordan's right there. And she's like, she feels bad. She's like, we'll go have sex in the car, right? And then you have the fast food guy showing up, chugging Jim Beam with a shotgun again and a mask. And then he goes in to... Uh, he goes into the motel where Jordan is the only one in there sleeping. And then you have Amy coming in to kind of save him. Right. To playing along that like, Oh, this guy, they did go out and she's the person he's looking for. So much Pulp Fiction vibes. And then you have again, Xavier fighting off this guy with the gun again. This time, instead of blowing his head off, he blows his arm off. And then ends up throwing the arm at him to get away. Hilarious. Uh, and then you have Jordan defending Xavier, even though he knows, probably knows that she fucked him. Like she's, he's defending Xavier. Uh, and uh, like this guy is like super positive, Jordan. Super positive guy. Almost like a monk, right? He's almost a monk. And the way he's like forgiving of everything and has like a positive outlook. This guy from Encino, <laughs> like that's his, <laughs> the worst tragedy is the fact that Polly Shore filmed a movie about a caveman that was dug up in his hometown. Um, you see the, the, another connection, sexual connection or connection between Jordan and Xavier. Xavier gets like this holographic, 3d sticker on his belt buckle and he's showing jordan and jordan's super into it and xavier's super into showing him um it's just like he's he's just so like jordan is is like hypnotized by this 3d thing like a baby hypnotized by a rattle uh then they go into this bar that is covered in aluminum foil which i don't know if that's supposed to play different like wa watching this movie that you're not supposed to notice that everything is covered in aluminum foil uh but it gives this bar a very weird look and we get the amazing parker posey shows up in this and again she mistakes amy for someone that she knows she pulls out a sword so not a shotgun this time and again they have to fight her off 
um she ends up stabbing her boy bruce uh but they end up getting away uh, of course bruce dies from the sword wound because it gets stabbed in his dick hole which you know c- critical place to be stabbed uh then they go to this checkerboard room another motel and there's you know one of the hotter sex scenes i would say um then you know when jordan leaves and she decides she wants to play a game with xavier um right either strangle him or she becomes or she like they play a game if if he wins or she wins she can strangle him and if he wins then she becomes his slave and she must obey him so right off the bat it's like oh this is oh here we go it's more sex like sexy sex scene and now we have this thing while jordan's away and jordan comes back just as they're having sex and he watch not only watches them but also jerks off watching from outside this motel room uh and you see that by this yo-yo that he bought that's just dangling by his feet um just like a very like this is a such a unique love triangle where they're all into it they're except for jordan doesn't know he's into it that's the one thing he's like clearly into it but he doesn't know he's into it and then they run into a shady group of dudes in suits uh again think that i that amy is somebody that they know right and they want to kill her um and at the same time like the it's an interesting relationship because like you have the relationship between amy and jordan there were multiple times where they like exchanged these kind of these very like uh, kisses that are like what you would give to a family member like kiss on the nose kiss on the forehead like there's these moments where it's like the connection that amy and jordan have isn't as strong as the connection that uh at least not all the time there's definitely some sexy moments that amy's definitely a different connection that amy has with xavier than that she has with jordan like jordan there it's much more innocent and xavier is like far more experienced i would say and the the connections between those those three are are you know uh guided by the the different experience levels and you see xavier trying to pitch a threesome uh talking to jordan telling him about like describing in detail what it feels like to dp somebody and it's another very sexy scene of him and it's you could tell that jordan's like put off by the idea of it but in the explanation he's like may that actually does kind of sound good um then you have a dog getting hit which just seems kind of unnecessary they also go in they're shoplifting cds another guy thinks that uh amy is somebody else named abby um no fighting this time in the cd store uh they go back and she flips a coin to see who like they're now they're in like a polyamorous thing and she flips a coin to see who's gonna go first and he i I think xavier goes first jordan goes to drink some beers in the car waits in the car right he doesn't want to be there um as they're like in this like abandoned where like it's just mattress in the middle of nowhere in like some warehouse and i like i don't know this not a motel but they are staying somewhere in, in this bed that's just on the floor in the middle of like a dark warehouse or whatever and you have amy and xavier having sex and sh- he's like convincing her to put a finger in his ass which is another aspect of this movie that's very 90s like a guy wanting to have his finger a finger in his ass is so like whoa for the 90s and for today is like okay that's just like there's a lot of people that are into that 
Like it's not like today that might be pegging, but I think even pegging is at a level where it's it's accepted uh, far more than, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But she's like he's he's into it. She's into it. So, you know, she's a little hesitant, but ends up doing it. Um, and then she does it to like when Jordan goes in, she's like, let's try. She like wants to try out these new things that she's doing with Xavier on Jordan. And he's totally like, I don't know. I don't know if like you want in my bum. And then Xavier joins. And then it's just like this montage of like them all having sex with each other. Very sexy. Um, and then he's even convincing her to pee when she comes. She like wants to stop so that she can go pee. Right. Which is basically squirting before squirting existed. Um, just a very sexy ahead of the curve, ahead of its time kind of a sex scene, especially for heterosexual audiences uh, of the 90s. Like, oh, how dare you? Uh, there's no straight man that would ever want a finger in his ass. That is only for homosexuals. Um but yeah, very, very sexy, very ahead of its time, I would say, for the 90s. Um, and then you have this dark kind of horror moment, how this movie ends, right? She goes to pee, lights go out. Like, it seems like just before Xavier and Jordan are going to start just enjoying each other without Amy, that's when the lights go out. And the Nazi Republicans show up. Uh, the Nazi Repu the the MAGA people of the 90s, before they even knew Trump would be their new idol. Uh, you know, these people with American flags painted on them uh, just, you know, lay out an American flag because that's where they're going to do their raping on. Uh, they pledge allegiance to the flag. These are like patriots. These are like 1990s MAGA patriots uh, in this movie, for sure. Uh, and then they, like, it's just, it's so horrible. Like, it's, I mean, you got, she's getting raped, forcing Jordan to watch. Xavier's tied up. He's just, like, on the mattress. Nothing bad is happening to him, but Jordan's the one. And then they end up cutting off Jordan's dick and feeding it to him like it just it goes it goes and then she kills him with uh the clippers the head shears that uh they use to cut off his dick um and she stabs their eyes out which is nice you know they cut off his her boyfriend's dick and fed it to him killed him a horrible way to go out and now she's able to she got free and is able to to immediately get revenge a very brutal end to this movie like everything like it's almost as it, i'm sure part of that meaning of the end is like everything's okay like they're dealing with a lot of society kind of treating them very weird and psychotic but as soon as the movie gets to the point where it's potentially two guys having sex with each other, that's when the Republican Nazis show up to cut the dude's dick off and feed it to him, right? That's when the real violence happens. Because sadly, I mean, not that much has changed, but, uh, you know, just horrible, horrible. And then the movie ends, which I think maybe it's a an homage to wayne's world but it ends with this doritos product placement and the last line of this movie is xavier asking amy you want a dorito this is the very last line as they drive away right they got away everybody else is dead Whew, that was a crazy ride all right let's go out on our own right great 90s movie not only for the many 90s elements that existed in it but also the story where teens are weirded out about ass play and open relationships and polyamorous relationships and this sexual fluidity being s such a novel thing uh the over-the-top campy nature of the the violence in this 
uh, aside from the the fine, I mean, it's definitely over the top. Not campy. I wouldn't say that's campy. Um, I mean, when you have the dude's head getting blown off and then tries to talk still and just you know, guacamole's coming out of it, it's just, you know, you can understand the tone that this movie is going for. It does a great job at setting that tone. And then the running gag of everyone thinking they know Amy. And I have, these are my theories. So it's either because she looks like the woman from Pulp Fiction, which I would imagine at that time in the 90s probably was a massive trend. Many women and girls looking like, was it not Uma Thurman? I forget the the actress that is that in Pulp Fiction. But it had to be in a massive look. So it's either this movie is commenting on how ubiquitous that look is now in society or it's uh she gets around a lot like she's had a lot of partners actually and she's just gaslighting everybody she's refusing to acknowledge that she was actually with all of these different people in the past because they get a close look at her and they think they know her, and Abby isn't far from Amy. So it's like, maybe she did have a different life before. Either way, it was a fun gag that allowed for just kind of a lot of crazy things to happen. You know, the darkness of how this film ends with the MAGA Republicans, the, I mean, at the time, the Reagan Republicans, I guess, uh, beating and raping the kid, or maybe even Bush Republicans, um not junior but senior um beating and raping the kids cutting off his junk and then stuffing in his mouth just absolutely brutal end to this movie despite it being a very sexy movie (laughs) it's a very sexy movie crazy things happen ends really dark uh but i'm excited to see the third and final film in this teenage apocalypse series uh nowhere which i'm going to be watching it's uh, available to rent on voodoo i think I'm going to watch that and review that next week. Very interesting, which I believe um, James Duvall is in that film as well. Looking forward to it. Uh, Really enjoyed this movie. Very 90s movie. Very Pulp Fiction-y movie with, like, Bill and Ted and uh, just some funny elements, some great elements, some darkness. It's got everything, this movie. Uh, But I want to thank everybody for tuning into The Ray Taylor Show. And I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on the Doom Generation. Don't forget to tune in every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for more movie and TV show reviews. And join the conversation by leaving a comment or rating on your favorite podcast platform or over on YouTube.com slash Inspired Disorder, where all these episodes are available in video format for you to watch. Until next time, enjoy the show. Subscribe to The Ray Taylor Show on YouTube and everywhere podcasts are found binge the full week ad free over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus purchase ray taylor show merch over at inspireddisorder.com have a wonderful day everybody peace out today is the day where you wake up and you realize that everything that you've been dreaming about everything that you've been wanting every goal and wish and hope that you've ever had can become real dreams can come true What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality.